The Lives of the Saints by Rev. Alban Butler, taken from the 4th edition, published in 1954. December 28th, The Holy Innocents. Our Divine Redeemer was persecuted by the world as soon as he made his appearance in it, for he was no sooner born than it declared war against him. Herod, in persecuting Christ, was an emblem of Satan and of the world. That ambitious and jealous prince had already sacrificed to his fears and suspicions the most illustrious part of his council, his virtuous wife Mariamne, with her mother Alexandra, the two sons he had by her and the heirs to his crown, and all his best friends. Hearing from the Magians, who were come from distant countries to find and adore Christ, that the Messiah, or spiritual king of the Jews, foretold by the prophets, was born among them, he trembled, lest he was come to take his temporal kingdom from him. So far are the thoughts of carnal and worldly men from the ways of God, and so strangely do violent passions blind and alarm them. The tyrant was disturbed beyond measure, and resolved to take away the life of this child, as if he could have defeated the decrees of heaven. He had recourse to his usual arts of policy and dissimulation, and hoped to receive intelligence of the child by feigning a desire himself to adore him. But God laughed at the folly of his short-sighted prudence, and admonished the Magians not to return to him. St. Joseph was likewise ordered by an angel to take the child and his mother and to fly into Egypt. Is our blessed Redeemer, the Lord of the universe, to be banished as soon as born? What did not he suffer? What did not his pious parents suffer on his account in so tedious and long a journey, enduring a long abode in Egypt, where they were entirely strangers and destitute of all succor under the hardships of extreme poverty? It is an ancient tradition of the Greeks, mentioned by Sotomon, St. Athanasius, and others, that at his entrance into Egypt all the idols of that kingdom fell to the ground, which literally verified the prediction of the prophet Isaiah. Mary and Joseph were not informed by the angel how long their exile should be continued, by which we are taught to leave all to divine providence, acquiescing with confidence and simplicity in the adorable and ever-holy will of him who disposes all things in infinite goodness, sanctity, and wisdom. Herod, finding that he had been deluded by the Magians, was transported with rage and anxious fears. To execute his scheme of killing the Messiah, the desired of all nations, and the expectation of Israel, he formed the bloody resolution of murdering all the male children in Bethlehem and the neighboring territory, which were not above two years of age. Soldiers were forthwith sent to execute these cruel orders, who, on a sudden, surrounded the town of Bethlehem and massacred all the male children in that and the adjacent towns and villages which had been born in the last two years. This more than brutish barbarity, which would almost have surpassed belief had not Herod been the contriver and ambition of the incentive, was accompanied with such shrieks of mothers and children that St. Matthew applies to it a prophecy of Jeremiah, which may be understood in part to relate more immediately to the Babylonian captivity, but which is certainly received the most eminent completion at this time. A voice in Ramah was heard, lamentation in great mourning, Rachel bewailing her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. Rama is a village not far from this town, and the sepulchre of Rachel was in a field belonging to it. The slaughter also was probably extended into the neighboring tribe of Benjamin, which descended from Rachel. The Ethiopians in their liturgy and the Greeks in their calendar count 14,000 children massacred on this occasion, but that number exceeds all bounds, nor is it confirmed by any authority of weight. Innocent victims became the spotless Lamb of God, and how great a happiness was such a death to these glorious martyrs. They deserved to die for Christ, though they were not yet able to know or invoke his name. They were the flowers and the first fruits of his martyrs, and triumphed over the world without having ever known it or experienced its dangers. They just received the benefit of life to make a sacrifice of it to God and to purchase by it eternal life. How few perhaps of these children, if they had lived, would have escaped the dangers of the world which, by its maxims and example, bear everything down before it like an impetuous torrent. What snares, what sins, what miseries were they preserved from by this grace? With what songs of praise and love do they not to all eternity thank their Savior, and this his infinite mercy to them? Their ignorant, foolish mothers did not know this, and therefore they wept without comfort. So we often lament as misfortunes many accidents, which in the designs of heaven are the greatest mercies. In Herod we see how blind and how cruel ambition is, which is ready to sacrifice everything, even Jesus Christ, to its views. The tyrant lived not many days longer to enjoy the kingdom which he feared so much to lose. About the time of our Lord's nativity, he fell sick. 
And as his distemper sensibly increased, despair and remorse followed him and made him insupportable both to himself and others. The innumerable crimes which he had committed were the tortures of his mind, whilst a slow and posthum inch by inch gnawed and consumed his bowels, feeding principally upon one of the great guts, though it extended itself over all the rest, and corroding the flesh, made a breach in the lower belly, and became a sordid ulcer, out of which worms issued in swarms, and lice were also bled in his flesh. A fever violently burned him within, though outwardly it was scarce perceptible, and he was tormented with a canine appetite which no victuals could satisfy. Such an offensive smell exhaled from his body as shocked his best friends, and uncommon twitchings and vellications upon the fibrous and membranous parts of his body like sharp razors cut and wounded to him within, and the pain thence arising overpowered him at length with cold sweats, tremblings, and convulsions. Antipater, in his dungeon, hearing in what a lamentable condition Herod lay, strongly solicited his jailer to set him at liberty, hoping to obtain that crown. But the officer acquainted Herod with the whole affair. The tyrant, groaning under the complication of his own distempers, upon this information vented his spleen by raving and beating his own head, and calling one of his own guards, commanded him to go that instant and cut off Antipater's head. Not content with causing many to be put to barbarous deaths during the course of his malady, he commanded the Jews that were of the principal rank and quality to be shut up in a circus at Jericho, and gave orders to his sister Salome and her husband Alexis to have them all massacred as soon as he should have expired, saying that as the Jews heartily hated him, they would rejoice at his departure, but he would make a general mourning of the whole nation at his death. This circumstance is at least related by the Jewish historian Josephus. Herod died five days after he had put his son Antipater to death. Parents, pastors, and tutors are bound to make it their principal care that children, in their innocent age, be by piety and charity consecrated as pure holocausts to God. This is chiefly to be done by imprinting upon their minds the strongest sentiments of devotion, and by instructing them thoroughly in their catechism. We cannot entertain too high an idea of the merit and obligation of teaching God's little ones to know him, and the great and necessary truths which he has revealed to us. Without knowing him, no one can love him or acquit himself of the most indispensable duties which he owes to his Creator. Children must be instructed in prayer and the principal articles of faith as soon as they attain to the use of reason, and they may be able to give him his first fruits by faith, hope, and love, as by the law of reason and religion they are bound to do. The understanding of little children is very weak, and is able only to discover small glimpses of light. Great art, experience, and earnestness are often required to manage and gradually increase these small rays, and to place therein whatever one would have the children comprehend. The solicitude and diligence of parents and pastors to instruct others in this sacred science ought not to lessen, neither must anyone regard the function as mean or contemptible. It is the very foundation of the Christian religion. Hence, Pope Paul III, in a bull in which he recommends this employment, declares that nothing is more fruitful or more profitable for the salvation of souls. No pastoral function is more indispensable, none more beneficial, and generally none more meritorious, we may add, or more sublime. For under a meaner exterior appearance without pomp, ostentation, or show of learning or abilities, it joins the exercise of humility with the most zealous and most profitable function of the pastoral charge. Being painful and laborious, it is moreover an exercise of patience and penance. Neither can anyone think it beneath his parts or dignity. The great St. Austin, St. Chrysostom, St. Cyril, and other most learned doctors, popes, and bishops applied themselves with singular zeal and assiduity to this duty of catechizing children and all ignorant persons. This they thought a high branch of their duty and the most useful and glorious employment of their learning and talent. What did the apostles travel over the world to do else? St. Paul said, I am a debtor to the wise and to the unwise. We became little ones in the midst of you, as if a nurse would cherish her children, so desirous of you that we would gladly have imparted to you not only the gospel of God, but even our own souls. Our divine Lord himself made this the principal employment of his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. He declared the pleasure he found in assisting that innocent age when he said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for the kingdom of God is for such. And embracing them and laying his hands upon them, he blessed them.